prevents me from getting caught up in judging and conflict and opinions and all that if I focus on the mantra. If I feel peaceful, the love is right there too. They're both right there. Constant judgment, constant opinions of how things should be. You're not going to be at peace when you're in your own self if you have these um, ill feelings about others. Have good thoughts. Say good words. Do good deeds. Hello and welcome. So glad you're here and so glad to be joined today by Swami Jyotirmayananda. Swami Jyotima and I have been living together now for about four years at the ashram. So we spent a lot of nice time, great conversations, and I'm super pumped to have her uh, on the podcast today. And I'd like to begin by just sharing a little bit about her background. She was initiated as a sannyasin in 1986. She's authored the children's book, Sparkling Together. She has served at the ashram in various capacities, including designing and installing displays at Lotus. She served as vice president of resident services and as vice president of spiritual development for a total of 10 years. She has turned many of her watercolor paintings into greeting cards, and she currently serves as the director of LCAF, Lotus Center for All Faiths. So Swamiji, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Yes, mm -hmm. my pleasure. All right, so I wanna begin by asking you about this. You have a, a definition of love that you used mm -hmm. uh, in the book. And love yeah. is knowing mm -hmm. that you are special and everyone else is special too. So I, I found that very interesting as a definition of love. You are special and everyone is special. And maybe it seems obvious, but why did you choose to to find love like that? Okay, so I, I'll give you a little um, background about this. Uh, the children's book I wrote, um, it's called Sparkle Together, Star Bright and His Earthling Friends. You can see it here. Um, and then the book is about universal love. And it has, is it okay, um, Avi, if I sit, tell a little bit about the book before I answer your question? Of course, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about this book, the background of it, um, and how I got into writing a children's book. I was uh, working with children in San Francisco uh, between 1977 and 82. I had an after-school program for kindergarten children. And they're all, you know, all about age five, and I noticed how, brilliant these children were. I was um, at the time learning, I just got involved in integral yoga. So I was learning the integral yoga teachings. I would pass them on to the children in terms they could understand. And I was just amazed at how at that age, the kids have all the questions and they also have all the answers. So I started this book, uh, but working with the children basically. And uh, what it is, I'll just um, read it from the uh, back of the book. It's um, eight stories that depict the adventures of Starbright, this is little outer spacey from planet Ohm, and Skyheart and his sister Rose of planet Earth. Each story encompasses a real life challenge common to childhood experience, including self-esteem, negative feelings, environmental awareness, a new home, new friends, an unemployed parent, a new sibling, illness, death of the pet, and death of the grandparent. So kind of the gamut of what children experience we all experience in our lives. And uh, guided by the outer space hero, Starbright, Sky and Rose discover that heartfelt love is the main key to success when they are faced with life's various challenges. So in writing the book, I really thought a lot, how do I define love uh, for children? And I went to explore many different possibilities and I came up with love is knowing that you are special and everyone else is special too. And love shines out through our thoughts, our good thoughts, words, and deeds. So um, I think um, love, it start, everything starts at home. You really have to develop your own self-esteem, have respect, have love for your own self before you can really reach out and love others. And maybe they happen at the same time. So um, anyway, this is kind of the background how I got into this definition of love. And um, 
you know, while we're at it, you know, I, one thing I did while I was working with the children, I uh, taped and sometimes took note of their conversations. Mm. And they had a lot to say about love. Now, would you like me to read a little bit about that? <laughs> that sounds amazing, please. Yeah, the, this is so. Uh, this is my uh, from years ago, basically, but I saved it. So this is on love. Okay, here's Jennifer. Keep your eyes closed. Look straight ahead. And think about the love inside you. Sarah, helping someone is another way of saying I love you. And sharing is a spirit of love. Then um, Jennifer, I'm the sun because the sun is mother nature and the sun is full of love. And uh, Sarah again, that, but sometimes I would take the kids to the beach. Do you know how I got warm? I got the love inside of me to keep me warm. And uh, let's see, Aaron, in God's way, that boy is my brother. Cole, in God's way, that bus driver is our uncle. Um, and Vanessa, I gave her house a little love. And I asked how. I went to the easiest part to get to the curtain and gave it a kiss. And uh, Vanessa, again, I love everybody in the whole world and send the bad people a good wish to get better. So this kind of gives you an example of how children have this capacity at that age to understand fairly deep uh, spiritual and philosophical concepts. And uh, anyway, this is um, kind of a background of my working with children in San Francisco. And I also worked with children before that and after that. And uh, I've always been a great lover of children. And of course, adults too. So Avi, what next? Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about the connection between relaxation or maybe feeling at peace and love. Mm -hmm. I found that like, if I really relax and I like let go, I feel peaceful. Then the love is waiting there for me. Hmm. Have you noticed anything similar to that? Um, I, I guess so. I, I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. But um, I think any of us, when we're in a more relaxed state of mind, it's easier to access the love inside of us and to share it with others. Yeah. And I, I think like, well, just maybe the Guru Dev emphasized peace so much because maybe it was a, a gateway to love. I mean, peace is great, but it's, it almost feels like they, they go hand in hand together. Mm -hmm. Peace and love to me. It's like, if I feel peaceful, the love is right there too. They're both right there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I would say that's definitely true. Um, you know, starting with the peace inside, and cultivating that peace through, I'd say, through your sana, through your practices. And then with the meditation, watching your thoughts. And when those thoughts get negative, that's not leading you to love. That's not expressing love. So I think one of our big challenges is to be the constant witness to see what are the thoughts in our minds. Are we judging people? Are we having opinions about people? Um, and I think this is what blocks the peace, blocks us from loving others, is by this constant judgment, constant opinions of how things should be, how the ashram should be, how your wife should be, how your um, workmate should be, your, you know, your um, pretty much anybody you deal with. Mm. It's um, the love is not going to get expressed if you're having a negative opinion about that person. Are there any practices you use for yourself to kind of focus more on that which you control, like yourself, right? So mm -hmm. what I hear you saying is, is, you know, it can be such a distraction to be judging everything around me, my environment, other people. Mm -hmm. I could spend my whole life doing that, just judging mm -hmm. things outside of myself. And it seems to me that that's like um, a tendency to do that because I'm distract as a mode of distraction from myself. I really don't, the, the inner work is too much to really, um, to mind my own business in a way, to stay in my own lane of, of my person and believing that if everyone does that, 
the world will be a better place. We'll live in a better place. Um, but I think all of us, right, fall into the trap of this judgment, of this distraction. So are there any practices you use for kind of bringing yourself back to yourself? Uh, yeah, I would say for me, uh, practice needs to be daily. It can't be just every now and then. So I've cultivated a, da- a daily practice of prayer and meditation. And uh, I, when I took my march initiation back in 1978, I think it was in San Francisco, um, I was really enamored by our Sanskrit prayers that we have as a, to begin our meditations with. So I memorized all those prayers and made a, a vow to say them every day, you know, as long as I live, even if I don't have time to actually meditate, sit down and really observe the silence. So I have found that that uh, practice stemming from that vow is to be, help me really to um, stay grounded in my own peace. It's one of my tools, I would say. And of course, I also uh, value the mantra repetition, which I do after my prayers and the Sanskrit prayers. And I have other prayers I say too. I actually have 20 minutes of prayers I say each morning. Um, some are interfaith, some are Sanskrit, some are from sannyas. Um, and then the uh, to, to stay focused, then I like to try to repeat my mantra as much as possible during the day. And um, that helps me to, uh, prevents me from getting caught up in judging and conflict and opinions and all that. If I focus on the mantra, um, that's a big help. But in, in the moment, like within a day when, okay, you're not, not chanting mantra, maybe you're in the food line, uh, yeah. whatever, you're walking, walking around, interacting with other people. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, do you find yourself in situations where, like the mind is developing a story about someone else, some kind of critique or judgment for someone else. And, you know, do you have any tools for, for kind of dealing with those situations? Like when it comes up, like when those situations come up in the midst of it, what, what is your tendency to do? Yeah. Yes. um, I, that happens. It seems like no matter who you are in this world, whether you're like you are, you're married or, you know, in my situation, I live with nine other swamis and, and uh, in, a, in a monastery. And so we basically get along fairly OK, but things come up like you're talking about in, in the day. So I think um, the best thing to, I find to do is try to resolve the, the uh, complex, however big or small, as soon as possible. And don't get caught up too much in trying to solve conflicts through email. Because sometimes I think it just gets worse. Uh, it's better in person. I can't do it in person on the phone, but I think sometimes email just, um, I think, makes things worse. So, yeah, I think to resolve things as soon as possible it, before you go to bed that night, try to resolve any kind of conflict, even if it's just in your mind and you have a plan. Okay, next day I'm going to go to that person and apologize for what I did. And sometimes I find too that. You know, you might have people, and this happens to me too, and you, you get accused of this, then the other thing, and you kind of feel very defensive, and um, which is so human, so natural. But I think the highest uh, thing to do in that case is we'll find out why did that person attack me about that certain situation and try to understand that person and why they're coming from. And so if you use your um, mind to understand, I think it'll help de-escalate any kind of conflict and and move toward resolution, basically. So um, anyway, that's kind of what I try to do. You're saying use your mind to understand where that person is coming from that maybe is Mm -hmm. judging you harshly? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. How do you decide, you know, which which situations to... um, kind of engage with and something needs to be expressed and worked out and other situations where you feel like it's just the mind running stories. My practice is just to let it go, mm-hmm. right? Like different things come up and some of them it's yeah. like, okay, I'm going to let this one go. And other ones it's like, okay, it's not so easy to let go or it doesn't feel right to let it go. This one, yes. I'm going to have the discussion with the person and try to yes. work it out. Uh, I think that's kind of a question of choosing your battles. And sometimes if it's something easy, you could, you let it go, but it kind of plays on your mind. You start thinking about it, and then you know that hour, few minutes moving on, you're still thinking about 
anything that you're still thinking about is something to think needs resolution. So, and, uh, and then other things, uh, you know, you can let go. You don't have to like kill somebody. I mean, I follow the, the current news, which is pretty much a horror story in many ways. But yeah, you hear about people killing each other over a parking place, a fight over a parking place. You know, it's, um, we're uh, definitely not going to do that here at Yogaville, but it's, you know, I think what happens with um, us in general, if we don't resolve conflicts, they mount up and they mount up and then they explode, you explode, you know? So it's really good, I think, on a daily basis to kind of check where am I at with my relationships with others and to, um, you're not going to be at peace within your own self if you have these um, ill feelings about others. What do you think about the activity of watching the news? <laughs> I, I, so you mentioned this, and I think it's it's quite interesting, right? That the news itself, right, to look at it objectively, of what it is, right, seems to be very much weighed in the direction of the negative, right? All these things are happening in the world all of the time, and yes. they're choosing certain things. Okay, this is newsworthy, right? Yes, but often like great. Um, great acts of kindness and good deeds. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll fit in something there, but it gets maybe well, maybe five percent of airtime, ten percent of airtime, right? So why would that be considered less new, newsworthy? Something mm-hmm. really good. And yeah. I guess my point is like, what is the effect of exposing ourselves to uh, um, information that is very negative mm-hmm. overall? And if we're taking self-care seriously mm-hmm. with ourselves and what I'm, you know, like being at the ashrams, like that's why I want to be here because it's a peaceful environment. And I realize that my environment affects me. Therefore, I'm going to put myself in the most peaceful environment I can. So the environment of the news in a way, mm-hmm. I, I mean, the flip side of that is like, I want to be informed, right? I know I want mm-hmm. to know what's going on with the world. Yeah. But the other side is how is this affecting me? And if I'm, you know, if I really want to serve and do good things, maybe all of those imprints are going in and it's making it harder for me to be my best self connecting with love, all of that. Mm-hmm. Any, any reflections on that? Like appropriate. Yes, and it's, uh, you have yeah. very good points there, Avi. Um, I guess kind of following in the footsteps of Sri Gurudev, who was an avid news uh, watcher, he really kept up and sometimes we come to satsang and say, and now we're going to pray for uh, Prime Minister Rubin was assassinated in Israel. No, it was, of course, in the 80s. Um, so I, I kind of feel that if I'm informed through the news and all the negativity, I know what to pray for then, you know? I'm much more informed of what, who needs prayers now. They need prayers in Gaza. They need prayers in Syria and Yemen and Afghanistan and Guatemala and Africa. There's so many areas in the world where people are really suffering. So I find that if I, and in this country too, so I find if I kind of know what's going on, I know more I'm about to put to pray for. And so, um, so I, I, you know, I certain um, I, I tend to watch it. Sometimes the evening I have a, uh, we have a TV in the common room. Nobody joins me except except myself. So I'll watch ABC News with David Muir, who's a very our PBS uh, uh, news coverage, and uh, you got to get informed. And I just recently, last week, I actually subscribed to the CNN has. Uh, a news coverage called the good stuff. It's all the good news. Mm. So I, I just started this. It's nice. They like you're saying, yeah, they so they broadcast stuff. It's good that's happening in the world. So it's nice to know that side too. Anyway, it's a, a habit I have, good or bad, that I feel in order to love all of humanity, I need to know what's happening. So uh, yeah. I'm glad to hear about that, the good stuff. And, and but you know, one time I remember I, I was talking to um this is the brother monk of uh, Sri Gurdas Swami Chitin, and they asked him the same question, but should we watch the news? And he said, well, if it disturbs your peace, don't watch it. So there are some things like in the news I find if it's gets getting really like too too graphic, I just either change the channel or close my eyes or why there's a certain limit I could take, you know? So I um, cut it off where I feel it's going to really disturb my peace. Mm-hmm. It's like it yeah, it's hard for me to not feel that it is disturbing my peace in the sense, and and more specifically, actually questioning my faith. Because when I hear about all of these things that are happening, you know, in the world on a large, negative things on a large scale, 
I feel like I go into the channel of things are getting worse. There's, you know, there's disaster, disastrous situations. Um, and, and there's a lot of concern. And when I feel concern, then my peace is disturbed. Right. Mm -hmm. So the flip side of that is, is having faith. Right. And Mm -hmm. for me saying, I don't know, you know, it's very complicated, all the good things and the bad things and whatnot. I'm just a limited human being. My job, my responsibility is to have faith. And I think one of the other points in in your book was it's all for good. So no matter what's happening to really believe that it's all for all that. I don't really know too much, but I have this core belief that somehow it's all for good. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You know, main teaching, basically, Lord, it's all your name, it's all your form, it's all your deed, it's all for good. So no matter what happens, it's going to move us in the right direction. Um, you know, just the other day at the ashram, on during Guru Purnima, that night, we had a huge um, rain, like the heaviest and the loudest rain I've ever heard, ever, and for three hours nonstop. And obviously, you said it went up to your place, too? Yeah. Yeah. So it was only in the Youngville Brown area. It wasn't in Scottsville, Dale One, or Lovingston. It was only this area. I think it was kind of Guru Guru Porma blessing. But then the next day, you know, there was damage on the Lotus Road, and there's uh, uh, some of the rooms here were flooded, and we had a lot of work to clean up, basically. So, but you look at that. Oh, well, it was Guru's blessing, and um, that's another way of it's all for good. Whatever happens, you know. So, and it's hard sometimes to see when. You know, we lose us, uh, like the people now dying from COVID-19. I mean, it's hard to see how this whole pandemic is all for good, but um, it is what it is. And the humanity is uh, facing it in various ways. So, um, you know, life is a mystery. Mm-hmm. That's one thing my dear mother, uh, one of her uh, teachings, she didn't have too many, but this one was pretty profound. Life is a mystery. Don't try to understand it. So sometimes at a certain point, I feel we have to just stop trying to understand why things are the way they are and just accept them. I love that so much because it seems that the mind wants to understand. It wants yeah. to figure out, yeah. but it forgets its limitation. I forget my limitation that I'm just a human mind. I can't understand the vast. I can't even understand a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I wanted to ask you about in in the story in you know, one of the the main characters, the kid Sky. Uh-huh. Uh, he makes a, a new friend, Ben, and uh, because he's been interacting with uh, Starbright, you know, who's from another planet, and he tells his friend Ben about it. <clears throat> ben doesn't want to be friends with him anymore because he thinks he's lying to him, mm-hmm. um, and so Sky is really upset because he wants Ben to like him. Mm -hmm. And I just thought this very, like a very core uh, feeling that maybe all of us or many of us have that we want to be liked by other people. It really, it really hurts when we're not, we don't feel that we're, we're liked by others. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I wanted to ask about your personal experience on that. Do you, do you have that tendency to, you know, want to be liked by other people? And does it is hurt for, does it make you feel hurt? Do you feel hurt if, if you're not liked? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that's um, we all of us as human beings want to be liked. You know, that's something kind of very natural. And uh, yeah, something happened to me the other day where a person was kind of uh, uh, not liking some some of the ways I approach my service here at the ashram, and not just now, but for years. And so I was very hurt because you know my service here at the ashram is kind of the core of what I do. And uh, so I was very hurt about it. And, but then I went, went to uh, the place of, and, and, and talked with another person to get, sometimes you have to kind of talk with a friend when you're trying to solve something, you're hurt by somebody. And then maybe you go to a friend who maybe knows the situation and you try to resolve it. And so what I realized is I went back to that kind of theory of try to understand why that person is uh, judging you in that way. And, uh, and then try to find a way to bridge the gap, find something you have in common with that person 
and talk about it or do something. And then um, they keep on exploring other ways to, to deal with the situation. But to get get over the hurt as fast as possible is, is kind of what I like to do um, because it's, uh, you know, being in that self-pity mode is not really helping anyone. Isn't that the truth? I feel like that that's there's like another epidemic that's that's going around the self pity that it, mm-hmm. it's quite popular to fall into that trap of of feeling. Yeah. Um, and what is that exactly? That feeling of self pity that I, I haven't been given enough good things in my life. I deserve yeah. more. Uh, or, or or the victim. You're the victim mode. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now, since you were talking about the book, which I just looked at the other, but this was published in 2004 by Integral Yoga Publication, and it is, is available at uh, uh, Integral Yoga Distribution and also on Amazon.com. It's also available on Amazon as an ebook. So, anyway, I was just thinking, I just marked it last night. I, the, each story has a moral, and Avi picked out the last moral and the first one. Uh, the first one is defines love is knowing that you are special and everyone else is special too. Love shines out to others by your good thoughts, words, and deeds. So obviously it's okay with you. I'm going to just go on to each story and just read the moral and see where we go with that. Is that okay? Sure. So the second story is about what we're talking about and uh, dealing with negative feelings. And in this uh, story, negative feelings are portrayed as like gray clouds that cover cover you up let go of the cloud that covers your heart and this was um the the uh, on the other planet and we have skateboards here and so on the other planet they'd had zoom boards this is way before zoom (laughs) came out (laughs) you know so i find it kind of funny that i i call them skateboards zoom boards not zoom is such a big deal here anyway so that's that more and then there's another story called about moving. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard for kids to move to another place. So that moral was the love in your heart stays with you wherever you go. Uh, so that's to help kids uh, on their moving to a new town, et cetera. And um, then another one is making new friends, helping hands make a happy heart. Kind of the idea of karma yoga for children. And then we have uh, when uh, somebody is ill, love helps to heal. So the idea is when you focus your love on somebody, that's going to help them heal. And then um, in this story, the father loses his job, which is so common, (laughs) father or mother. Always keep hope in your heart. You're, You're just talking about having faith in has in the world, which is kind of like going through so many challenges. And that's something that Gerda really taught. As, uh, and even politicians like uh, President Clinton, President Obama, the idea of keeping hope in your heart that things will improve as time goes on. That's something that a good teaching. And then, um, of course, the last one was uh, It's All for Good. And this is from a, an old song, I think from the 50s. Every cloud has a silver lining. Wait until the sun shines through. I wrote that down. There's another thing I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Yeah. The the pace, the practice of patience when we're going mm-hmm. through challenging things. I've really found that to be very, very helpful. That I don't need to figure it out right then in that moment mm-hmm. when it's hard. Um, I can just wait. And it seems really hard to wait. But the, the, as you as you put it, the sun will will shine through. Um, That's true. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to shift uh, with some time that we have left and ask you about your interfaith work. You know, mm-hmm. and much in the design for Lotus and and just in general, you still serve as the director of Lotus Center for All Faiths. So, mm-hmm. you know, why why have you chosen to focus your attention, your energy in interfaith work? Yes. Um, well, that goes back to, I guess, when I moved to San Francisco, I'm from the Bay Area, 
originally. And, and for a while, I lived for four hours up in this little town called Paradise in Northern California, which actually a couple years ago, the whole town burnt down. Again, this is the, the news that we get all these fires and floods. I mean, it's like, it's, um, anyway, when I lived in Paradise, it was Paradise, a great place to live. But then I we decided to move to San Francisco. I happened to get a, uh, an apartment a block away from the Yoga Institute, and that's how I got involved in Indigo Yoga. But at that time, I was really, San Francisco like, has all sorts of different faiths to explore. It has, you know, Buddhists and Shinto and Taoists and you know, Jewish. And I went out to explore all these different faiths, Sufism and whatnot. And that's kind of how I got interested in interfaith. And then I ended up with integral yoga as my base spiritual faith, basically. But I uh, still uh, developed the appreciation for other faiths over the years. And uh, when I got to Yogaville, um, I, um, well, actually, before I got to Yogaville, I was very interested in interfaith, uh, the music of different religions. And so, and I was studying a Chinese instrument at the time. And so I thought, well, that day, you know, interfaith is part of the, the Intergoga mission. So I went down to the San Francisco Library and took out all these albums and made tape recordings of ritual music from different faiths. And when I got here, I just started sharing it with people. And it's become kind of a, kind of a, a, a significant part of our interfaith service. And so just recently, um, on lotus.org, we uh, got permission from sources uh, to use this music, and now it can be downloaded for anybody that wants to use interfaith ritual music for a service or a prayer circle or for their own listening. It's on our website, lotus.org, under resources, under interfaith aids. So I'm really happy that we, you know, uh, accomplished that. And the other thing that um, happened when I got here it, Lotus was uh, being planned. It was being um, discussed on what was going to be inside Lotus, basically. And the downs, the, the lower level was supposed to be a library. And coming from more of an art background, and, you know, I graduated from UC Berkeley, um, but, um, you know, I've never been a great reader. <laughs> I had to read and, you know, do uh, past classes and all that. Um, but I, libraries are not my thing. Art museums are what I like. Um, so I drew up a sketch of why don't we make the lower level like a display with artifacts of different faiths, the scripture, um, pr their prayers and artifacts. And I just spent a lot of time on it. And then I sent it over to Sri Gurudev thinking that he would, he didn't know me that well at the time. That's kind of the new kid on the block. So I didn't think he would do anything with it, but he liked it. <laughs> this is so typical of Shigeru that if he likes something, he doesn't care where it comes from. So um, anyway, so I got involved in uh, setting up the uh, whole face hall in Lotus before internet. So we had to, all those items, about three of those items are, were in Gurudev's collection that had been given to him. And uh, the rest we, uh, Hamsanand and I did, she was a typist, so she typed all these letters to these different organizations around the world that sent in the items. Um, and uh, then we, a lot of us, a lot of people worked in helping to set up the displays. And so um, anyway, that's how I kind of got involved. And I always like to mention that I felt uh, one aspect of Shigurita that I uh, so appreciated with his amount of trust. You know, sometimes we don't trust each other. And I felt she girded, um, trusted me with a rather major project, even though I was kind of like the new kid on the block. So um, anyway, that's one thing I always appreciated by Shri Gurdjieff. And he was so not a micromanager, you know, just the opposite. He would occasionally come in, oh, how about this way, how about that? But I was not micromanaged at all in that whole project. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's kind of how I got involved in interfaith and um, then we started as the Lotus Center of Old Face, of which I'm the, now the director, is like the outreach arm of Lotus. And we uh, make sure that we uh, celebrate the uh, holidays of the different faiths uh, here at the ashram and bring in um, our own members and other people from clergy from other places to educate us more about the different faiths. And then the other thing we've done in the past years, I don't know if it's going to continue, is attend these big conferences 
like I've attended about nine interfaith conferences in this country and Canada over the last several years. And uh, the last one was in Toronto in 2018 with 10,000 people. Now, this is before the pandemic. I don't know if we're ever going to get together that many people to have an interfaith conference. So now the interfaith conferences are going online. So um, I don't know the future of this, uh, of the conferences, but I think the whole interfaith movement has um, really um, become established. And right now, the whole direction of the movement is dealing with all the, uh, like we call the bad news of the world, things that are happening, like, like the conference in Toronto. There's five days in each day. One was dealt with like uh, indigenous rights, one with a climate crisis, uh, one with uh, women's rights, um, like uh, the violence in the world. Each day dealt with, in, dealt with a different kind of topic. And so that's kind of what the interfaith movement now is doing. And for us at Yogaville, our main um, cause we took on uh, was uh, uh, trying to stop the Atlantic Coast pipeline. We kind of approached our interfaith from an environmental uh, standpoint and dealt with that. So, um, so interfaith is um, pretty, getting pretty well established in the world. And I think it's going to help uh, create more goodness. And it, it is already creating more goodness. People are from different faiths are working together around the world. Um, there's a, a group called United Religions Initiative, which we are a part of. These are cooperation circles, about 400 around the world, where from a grassroots level, people get together to take on uh, issues and missions to improve the world in your area and to learn more about their their uh, faith of their neighbors. So anyway, that, uh, uh, and I do, uh, uh, the, I'm not a real big book reader, but the, most of the books I read are either our scriptures, the Yoga Sutras or the Bhagavad Gita or an interfaith book. And right now I'm reading a book called The Faith of Our Neighbors. And I find that quite interesting. So anyway, that's my uh, involvement with interfaith. Yeah. I just just add, and probably many people listening have, have been to Lotus. Um, and I know that many people have powerful uh, experiences going in there. And I'm definitely not an exception to that. I went in and I mean, I just, you mentioned goodness. I mean, I was hit with a wave of, of love and goodness when I looked around at the displays, um, you know, and, and it's just, you see the truth of of the similarity the truth is one paths are many i mean and it's to see it there like you can't deny it when you go to each section and you look into what they're saying what they're talking about about the truth and you're like okay that's that's similar there that's similar there that's similar there and but it's not saying that we all have to drop our faith either it's saying each one has its own validity um that you know totally, totally be engaged with your particular faith, but also not getting into my faith is better than your faith, right? That's a trap. And that's actually how I started with the definition of love, where it's like, I'm special, but you get to be special too. So I think it's mm -hmm. the same thing with, with yes. religions, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that that's why it's, it, it's really powerful, but it seems maybe a little challenging to walk that line and not get into the mm -hmm. trap of, mm -hmm of like, oh, all these religions are great, but integral yoga is even better because we celebrate yes. all of them, right? Stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, that is a trap that uh, uh, we definitely try to avoid. And uh, certain religions over the years have uh, got into that. I was just reading last night about, um, in this book I'm reading now, Vatican II uh, in 19, uh, was it 60s, you know, 1962, Pope John the 23rd had an ecumenical kind of council and it was huge in the Catholic church. And they switched from the uh, head mindset of thinking the Catholic faith is the only true faith and it, it, nobody's not in it, you go to hell basically. And so they switched over to the idea of, uh, uh, you know, yes, our faith is special, but others are special too and try to encourage the morality and the spirituality in other faiths and not uh, judge them. Um, as uh, 
not being correct in what they're viewing. So that was that was a big change in the Catholic faith and Catholic religion. And so um, I think um, people that are, uh, I think very thing with interfaith is basically you want to go deep and find your own spiritual core, go deep into that. But at the same time, really respect all the other faiths like you would in a family, like you love your aunts and your uncles and your cousins and all that. You want to appreciate and uh, respect every all the other faiths. But don't stop from finding your own spiritual core, basically. So. Mm. Final question for you. I wanted to ask you about being an artist. Okay. And, uh, when you when you practice art, like what if some if you're successful, which I would say you're successful looking at a lot of a lot of your art, what allows you to be successful as an artist as an artist? Uh, well, when you say I'm an artist, I'm not like a, a, a renowned artist. I'm like a other than maybe at Yogaville, some people know my art. They know my artwork because I have these these cards that I've uh, developed for my artwork in the cards, like this is a series I did for many, many years. I just did hearts basically. So, uh, and uh, then I got into uh, doing uh, Lotus. Uh, there's a blue one, there's a pink one. Uh, so, and these are also available. Integral There's so many more too. You've and, done a ton of them. Yeah. Well, yeah, I do. The thing, my thing with art, this this is an interesting one. Okay, this one I did during an earthquake, and and here at Yoga Bell, our one earthquake in the last forty years. And coming from California, I've been through earthquakes. It wasn't a big deal to me, but I worked with very wet paper, and the paper was trying to dry. And I thought I got to finish this art piece. I don't care about the earthquake. So. Anyway, that has an interesting story. Um, but to, for me, with art is to, uh, it is a real meditation for me. It helps me to get into another world of where I'm not worrying about my resolutions. I need conflicts I need to solve and all that, or, you know, the latest drama at the ashram. And so I think being successful in art is not being successful in the way that you sell all your artwork. I just don't even bother to go down the road at this point. When I pass away, let other people do that. So, um, but you want to be successful and then you're happy with what you're doing and how you're progressing. And so when I finish a piece of art, I'm always thinking, well, the next time I sit down and paint, I'm going to maybe make this one a little bit different. I usually tend to work in series. So I'll make the next in the series this way. But I work quite fast. You know, the watercolor, if you overwork it, it doesn't look good. So I heard if I spend more than two hours on a painting, it's, that's not good. So that's why I have a lot of artwork is because I, they're, 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 it's not like oil, oil painting. You could go over forever and spend years on it. But uh, with watercolor, it's better to kind of get over with. Otherwise, it looks overworked. So uh, but I, I took up watercolor actually more of it since I've been in Yoga Bell. And um, I really enjoy that medium. When I studied art in college at UC Berkeley, um, I work more on big canvases with acrylic and a whole different style. And, um, but now it's, it's easy for me to set up watercolor. Um, it's, uh, you know, fairly easy medium to work with. I don't work real huge. Uh, um, so anyway, it's, it's fun for me and people seem to like the product. So, um, that's, that's, that's kind of nice. I think nice. that's the key is that it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Usually when things are fun, something good. Well, I've heard that used to say that. He used to say life is for fun. And he was such a great example of a person who really enjoyed life. And I think that's something we um, all need to do is each day set aside a little time to have enjoy life, have a few laughs, um, enjoy each other and have fun. And that's one thing I could say with the pandemic at the ocean. I feel that we're becoming closer as a yoga built family. Um, you know, with um, whether you live uh, in the community or sort of the ashram, I feel it has brought us closer in ways. And I think that's one of, it's all for good. That's one thing that's been happening. That is good. So. The priority of, of fun is an interesting one. I, I love that Sri Gurudev says that this uh, is the point of the point of it all to like, even just set that intention, like, Wow, am I having fun? Are things fun? Yeah. As like as a priority, yeah. almost a sadhana in itself yeah. to have fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, he always wanted us to enjoy our service, basically. Uh, our service should be enjoyable. I'd like to close with, I think, the main message uh, from your book, which I just mm -hmm. I love so much. It's so simple. Just have good thoughts. Say good words. Do good deeds. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.